All right, everybody, welcome to the first part of our new block. Um, this is all about finance this semester, this block. We're going to be talking about economics and altruism and then different revenue sources and then spending and other governance issues. Um, what we're actually going to be talking about first is the econ, econ stuff, specifically altruism as it relates to economics. Um, the goals for today's class session, uh, know the characteristics of public goods which you guys, I think, probably have pinned down by now, but we'll make sure. Know the three different kinds of altruism um, that economists have identified, then know and understand the significance of the Nash equilibrium in questions of altruism. So let's start off by talking about public goods. Um, as all of you probably already know and remember well, right, a, a public good is non-rival, meaning the consumption by one doesn't reduce the good for another. And then they're also not excludable. Regarding non-rival, an example of a non-rival good is like oxygen, right? There's so there's enough of it around on the planet that uh, my consumption doesn't doesn't reduce it in a practical way for you. Um, watching a sunset is the same way. The truth is, there's nothing that's purely well. I mean, there there are very few things. I'll say that that are purely truly non-rival. But. But we only care about whether or not they're non-rival for in a practical sense. So even though when I breathe oxygen, there actually is less of it in the world for everybody else, um, the, the, the point is that it's so abundant that in a practical sense, it's non-rival. All right, non-excludability means I can't keep people out by artificial means. And so a non-excludable good would be, uh, for example, every year we have Stadium of Fire in Provo, which is the big fireworks show that they put on at the at the football stadium. Um, part of that show is excludable, right? Because they only have so many seats in the stadium, so you buy tickets. But from the outside, they can't stop you from seeing the fireworks display. And so from the outside of it, you can see all the big fireworks going up in the air, which is pretty cool. All right. The reason this relates to nonprofits, usually when people talk about public goods, they think about the public goods that, that uh, government generates, but nonprofits are just, they're in the business of producing public goods, even if their explicit activity is producing non public goods. And so when we talk together in class, I'm going to use an example of an old fashioned soup kitchen. I wanted to discuss how something like a soup kitchen right because they're providing excludable goods or no they're providing non-public goods because they're excludable meaning they can keep out rich people from eating their you know the food they're providing and they're also rivalrous right like i mean the soup that somebody eats is soup that nobody that somebody else doesn't get and so they're not providing a public good in the form of food for uh, low-income people but um, they are providing public goods and i want to talk about those public goods we'll discuss that together in class all right, so let's move over to altruism. Altruism relates to public goods in an important way because we get public goods, public goods have to be paid for. They're, they're, you know, um, that's how we uh, generate most public goods. Some public goods are paid for through taxes. And so, for example, you know, our park system, uh, we, the national park system, local parks, whatever, they're all paid for out of tax revenue. And, uh, and so that's how we get them, is because of taxes. We wouldn't have them, but for taxes. Uh, another source for, of funding for public goods is pooling, and this is where a community gets together to fund sort of more on a voluntary, on a voluntary basis, um, and so it's a public good for that population. Homeowners associations create public goods all the time. They create public spaces where all HOA members get to, get to join in. So there might be like a neighborhood clubhouse that you can use if you sign up. That's a public good for your neighborhood, but it's created by pooling, not by taxes in that case. So there's a voluntary nature there. Um, but everybody who sort of, who contributes to the pool gets access to the good. So in the first case, taxes are compulsory, but everybody gets it. In the second case, pooling is voluntary, but everybody in the pool gets it. Um, the third is altruism, and altruism is unique because people voluntarily pay for the public good, but they're not even necessarily the ones who get it. And also people who don't contribute altruistically can still get access to the public good. And that's what makes altruism unique, is because it's a voluntary form of public good that uh, of paying for public goods that doesn't require payment to have access. Uh, in fact, paying for it doesn't even guarantee access. Like if I'm a donor to a soup kitchen, I'm contributing to the public good, but it's not like I'm eating there. So uh, that's something to consider. All right, um, altruism is an interesting concept on many levels. Um, it's got evolutionary significance. Um, 
uh, evolutionary biologists that study survival of the species find that it is a survival trait um, when members of the species are willing to protect or defend others at a personal cost or provide for others. Uh, a mother bear protecting her cubs is an example of this. Rational behavior would say run away and, and have more cubs next year, but that's not how they do it. Um, they put themselves at personal risk in order to protect their young. Um, there are really extreme examples of this in nature where the mother, for example, dies as a result of childbirth, and that's just what happens every time. Um, and so, or laying eggs or whatever it is. And so, um, <clears throat> so it has evolutionary significance. The problem, of course, for economists is that human beings don't always value promotion of the species. And so to describe altruism as just about promoting, you know, the, the human race, that doesn't always work. In fact, it doesn't always describe the way people, why people behave altruistically. Um, and so economists work off an operation, work off the assumption of self-interest, which says that, um, you know, people are primarily motivated by personal interest um, when they make decisions. Well, if that's true, then why are they donating? Why are they volunteering? And so economists have to kind of alter or address altruism uh, uh, through this mechanism or assumption of self-interest. Um, in fact, it's been a problem for centuries. Economists have always sort of struggled with understanding why it is people behave altruistically. Here's an early classical economist wrote that how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortunes of others <clears throat> and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. And so for some reason, seeing other people's happiness is necessary to our own to a certain extent. Well, from the same time period, somebody wrote, but man has almost constant occasion for the help of his brethren, and it, and it is in vain for him to expect it from their benevolence only. I mean, we shouldn't rely only on the benevolence of others. Instead, we're more likely to prevail if we can interest their self-love in our favor, meaning we get their selfish interest to help us, to, to promote our interests, then we do better, um, showing them that it's to their own advantage to do what we require. Well, both of these quotes actually come from Adam Smith, who's sort of seen as the father of, of classical free market e economics. And uh, interestingly enough, is sort of seen as the, the primary proponent of, of self-interested behavior. But the reality is Adam Smith knew well that people craved and desired the well-being of others and that that was necessary to their happiness. Um, so moving on, the, the economists have identified kind of three different types of altruism based on motive. Um, the first is kind of a philosophical one called pure altruism. This is you give. This is where you give without any personal benefit. There's no exchange. There's no benefit at all from giving. You give for the sake of giving. It's the act itself that motivates you. Um, the second is impure altruism, where you give, but in exchange for giving, you get a warm glow. Um, the warm glow benefit is sort of the good feeling you get. It might be prestige, it might be other things, but the point is it creates an emotional response that motivates your giving. The third kind is enlightened self-interest. And this is different because instead of promoting um, warm glow, right, you're instead looking for some eventual outcome, even if it's remote. So there's this remote expectation of future gain, such as, you know, if I, give, if I donate to the soup kitchen, it reduces crime in my community. Well, that's a personal benefit, you know, having a safer neighborhood. Uh, and that would be the reason you give, not because it makes you feel good. <clears throat> I wanted, we're going to discuss these in class. And I'm curious what you think about each of these categories. Um, because, uh, you know, for example, does pure altruism even exist in the way human beings behave? So we'll talk about that. And also about the mor moral superiority of any of these three. Is one of these morally superior to the others? We'll discuss that too. All right, one of the problems with altruism is it creates an opportunity for free riders. Um, so the, the Nash equilibrium, and those of you who've taken econ recently from Professor Turley remember how this works, but the Nash equilibrium is basically the point in a combined activity where no person can improve his outcome by being the only person to change. Um, basically, it says that you've reached an equilibrium point if, if, if nobody else changes their mind and, and, you change, and changing your mind makes you worse off, then, uh, then that's the Nash equilibrium. Um, the reason that matters in altruism is because it actually affects the way people think about donations. Um, for example, uh, 
which of these capital campaigns would you contribute to? One of them is trying to raise, so they're both going to produce the same thing. Say it's a, a, a library edition. And you'll benefit the same from both. So they're equivalent to you in terms of personal benefit. One of them is trying to raise $40,000, but has already raised ten. The other is trying to raise $30,000, but hasn't raised any money. I want, uh, I'm curious, which one are you more likely to donate to and why? Bring your answer to class because we're going to discuss it together. There's a reason that matters because the Nash equilibrium plays into this in a way we'll, we'll share. Okay, so the thing about free riders is that all public goods create a potential for people to become free riders. That's the nature of a public good is that they're non-excludable, which means you can't always keep people out that don't contribute. This is the big controversy over the income tax regime, right? That a lot of people don't pay an income tax. Lower income people don't pay an income tax because of how it's structured. Well, for a lot of other people, that feels like free riding, and so it, it bothers them. Um, the uh, uh, but that's the nature of public goods, right? Is that you create the potential for free riders, and, and they and free riding means they benefit without benefit from the public good without contributing to it. You know, we have social norms to look down on free riders for various reasons, right? We can um, sort of embarrass them socially speaking. But the really interesting and I think more important question here is if if a public good is funded by altruism, should we care if people free ride? And I want to discuss that question in class too, because should it matter if I'm giving out of the goodness of my heart, should I care if other people give or not? And if I do care, what's the reason? Um, so we'll dig into that. All right, so let's tie this all back to the nonprofit industry, some observations. Uh, first of all, society likes the public goods generated or provided by nonprofits, that's obvious. That's why we provide tax exempt status. Another important observation is that few people are pure altruists, most are impure altruists, and we'll discuss that idea in class. And almost everyone free rides at some point. And so when nonprofits get frustrated by free riders, they need to remember that that's the nature of the public good that they're providing. Nonprofits also need to be interested in the different kinds of impure altruism that motivate people, because if you're all about generating warm glow for your potential donors, then you need to know what it is that gives them warm glow. Some people, for example, only get warm glow from their own donation. So if they give a donation, they feel good. If other people give a donation, they don't care. Some people get warm glow from, from the beneficiary's happiness, right? So it's not so much that I gave a gift, but it's that I see the beneficiary being happy. And if I donate it, that makes me feel even better. So you can put on a public campaign to, to help everybody in the community feel good about what you do, even if most of them don't donate. But they feel good. And then if they donate, they feel even better, is how that works. The third is is a warm glow that comes from beneficiaries' happiness, but only if bought in. So this would be a public campaign where you're telling the world what you do, and somebody says, you know, I don't really care because I didn't donate to that. But if they do donate, then they feel good because they contributed to the beneficiaries' happiness. Some other motivations for altruism that are interesting and important for nonprofits in a practical sense. Uh, a lot of people are motivated by sympathy when it comes to altruism, meaning they like to donate to people like themselves. And we're going to have a class session talking about this. Well, we'll cover this among other subjects. Um, but it's important to understand that some people are motivated by by helping those that are like them. Um, that certainly will be how BYU tugs at your heartstrings when you all become alumni. When you graduate, they're going to call you and they're going to invite you to donate. They're going to try to remind you of what it was like to be a student. And they're going to tell you that you're donating to current students who were like you one day. And, uh, and, and that reminder of, of likeness is going to generate sympathy and hopefully donations to BYU. But there's another motivation for altruism put forth by an econo a Nobel Prize winning economist named Amartya Sen. And he made the point that a lot of altruism is motivated by commitment, meaning we make promises. And sometimes those promises come at a cost, a personal cost, but we do it because that's the nature of a promise. And we have these commitments to each other, and those commitments are the source of our altruistic decisions. Uh, and then a much more cynical perspective is the keeping up version from Sugden, also an economist, and he pointed out the law of altruism is just based on signaling. It's just about telling the world what kind of person you are. And if you're not keeping up with everybody else around you in terms of your giving, then you're not sending the right signals. And so keeping up is a form of motivation for altruism. It's a little more cynical, right? But it's, but it's this idea that I, you know, if everybody in my neighborhood is donating $20 to this charity, I would feel silly for donating less than 20 So 
Okay, well, that's it. We're going to discuss all these uh, fascinating concepts more in class, but that's the quick overview. We'll see you next time.